This video is about how to lose weight and how to prevent weight gain without counting or tracking calories. Maintaining a healthy body weight in the long term is key to our overall health. How do we do this without constantly being hungry and restricting ourselves? In this video, I will share my top seven strategies for answering this question. Each strategy is supported by high quality research and will point you towards concrete steps you can take right away. Welcome to Nourished by Science on YouTube. My name is Mario and in this video I will cover what I see as the best and most sustainable way to lose weight based on my 25 years running clinical trials on this topic and on my careful review of the research literature. Even if you don't need or want to lose weight, the approach I will share is similarly valuable in preventing weight gain. Let's dive into it. You may have heard that it's best to eat until you are comfortably full. Not over full and this is good advice, but when do you think you do feel comfortably full? Most people assume it is once you have eaten a certain number of calories. They also assume that the number of calories you need to feel full is a rather fixed number. Well, this is a misconception. The number of calories we need to eat to feel comfortably full is actually not a fixed number, but more of a range. And whether we need to eat a high or low number of calories in that range is related to the quality of our diet. This is a key concept to understand and is the basis of my weight loss approach. Let me briefly explain this in more detail before I share concrete suggestions with you on how to lose weight without counting calories. It's important first to understand why we often eat too many calories in the first place. The relationship between diet quality and calorie intake. The quality of our diet partly determines the amount of calories we need to feel comfortably full after a meal. Let's look at an example. This is Sam. He's an average 24-year-old who eats a pretty average US American diet. In other words, not a great diet. Most of his calories come from ultra-processed foods, fast foods, white flour bread, and sweetened breakfast cereals. He also drinks soda or beer and regularly enjoys candy, chips, and ice cream. Sam doesn't count or track his calorie intake and just eats until he feels comfortably full at each meal and his daily calorie intake on this diet is around 3,600 kilocalories. He has been gaining weight regularly on this diet and his weight is now 210 pounds with a body mass index of around 29 kilograms per meter squared. Worried about his recent weight gain, Sam wants to lose some weight. One approach that is often proposed is that he should simply start to track his calorie intake and make an effort to consciously restrict his calorie intake. So of course, if he restricted his calorie intake to say 1500 kilocalories per day, he would start to lose weight. But would this be the best approach and would Sam be able to maintain it in the long run? Evidence shows most people cannot maintain this in the long run. Because an important question we need to ask ourselves is why Sam is eating 3,600 kilocalories per day on his typical diet. We understand this very well if we look at the scientific evidence. Why we eat too many calories and gain weight and what to do about it. Research has identified several factors that spontaneously lead to higher calorie intake in people who simply eat until they're comfortably full. Let's discuss these and how they could help us figure out how Sam could change his diet to reduce his calorie intake without ever counting or actively restricting his calorie intake. The first factor known to strongly raise calorie intake is liquid calories from sugar sweetened or alcoholic beverages. We have lots of very strong data showing clearly that calories consumed in these types of beverages are simply consumed on top of whatever solid foods we are eating. They don't seem to contribute to our sensation of satiety during a meal, and so our overall calorie intake goes up the more sugary and alcoholic beverages we consume. In Sam's case, depending on how much soda, juice, energy drinks, and beer he drinks regularly, he could easily cut a few hundred calories from his diet if he cut back on these beverages. And because these beverages don't contribute to his feeling of satiety anyway, cutting them out would not make him more hungry. In other words, Eliminating sugar sweetened or alcoholic beverages would be the lowest hanging fruit for anyone who wants to lose weight. This is strategy number one. Stop drinking sugar sweetened and alcoholic beverages, perhaps outside of a few special occasions. Second, ultra processed foods or UPF seem to very robustly contribute to higher calorie intake. 
UPF are industrially designed foods that usually contain ingredients extracted from whole foods, such as starch or modified starch, sugar or high fructose corn syrup, and oils. And they typically also contain food additives that are not commonly used in a kitchen, such as emulsifiers, thickeners, artificial sweeteners, flavor enhancers, and the like. Many of these types of foods have been designed to be what we call hyperpalatable by combining the right amounts of fat, sugar, and salt so that they trigger our bliss point. In other words, many UPF were designed to trigger overeating. And it seems very successfully so. Data from observational and a few intervention studies consistently and strongly suggest that people spontaneously eat way more calories if their diet is rich in UPF. On his typical American diet, Sam gets about 60 to 70% of his calories from UPF, and reducing these to consume more unprocessed or minimally processed foods would help him eat fewer calories without feeling deprived or hungry. So my second strategy is to replace ultra-processed foods with unprocessed or minimally processed foods as much as possible. Third, people tend to eat more calories if they consume hyperpalatable foods even if they are not UPF. For example, a donut or cake made at home may not be a UPF, but if it consists primarily of fat, flour and added sugar, it may be similarly irresistible and you would be eating hundreds of calories with just a few bites. Hyperpalatable foods are generally combinations of fat and sugar, fat and salt, or refined grains and salt. So Sam should eat fewer baked goods that combine fat and sugar, such as cake, cookies, pancakes, waffles, or donuts, and also fewer foods that combine fat and salt, such as bacon, hot dogs, potato chips, and pizza. If we value our health, all of these should be seen as occasional treats, not everyday food. So strategy number three is to minimize your consumption of hyperpalatable foods consisting of fat and sugar, fat and salt, or refined grains and salt. The fourth factor worth paying attention to is energy density meaning the number of calories per 100 grams of food. We have lots of very compelling research data showing that if a meal or a diet has a high energy density, people consume more calories, independent of other factors. Foods with a high energy density are isolated fats and oils, as well as added sugars and syrups, and refined grains and starches. That means that foods or meals that contain a lot of added fats and oils, or a lot of added sugar, high fructose corn syrup, or starch, tend to be very energy dense, and as explained just a minute ago, they also are often hyperpalatable if they combine fat with either sugar or starch. If Sam replaces some of the ultra-processed foods and fast foods he eats with home-cooked meals, he should pay attention to how much of these concentrated sources of energy he uses to prepare his meals. So strategy number four is consume mostly meals with a low energy density by using added fats and oils, added sugars and syrups, and refined grains and starches sparingly. Okay, so far we have mostly emphasized what to eat less of. Less sugar-sweetened and alcoholic beverages, less UPF, less hyperpalatable foods, and less added fats and oils, sugar and syrups, and refined grains and starches. That raises the question what to eat instead. And that brings us to our fifth point, and that has to do with the observation that people eat more calories if their diet is low in protein and fiber. That is because per calorie, protein is more satiating than fat or carbohydrates, and fiber provides a lot of bulk that makes us feel full without providing any calories. So Sam should increase the amount of protein and fiber he consumes relative to his overall calorie intake. Strategy number five is therefore to ideally center each meal around a solid portion of a protein-rich food and higher fiber plant foods. Protein-rich foods include meat, fish, dairy, eggs, tofu, tempeh, beans, and lentils. Higher fiber plant foods include vegetables, beans, lentils, fruit, and berries, and whole grains. An example meal would be a piece of meat with a large salad, fish with roasted vegetables, low-fat Greek yogurt with berries, or a soup with lentils or beans and vegetables. Two additional factors contribute to high calorie intake. These factors are not directly related to diet quality, but they are still worth mentioning here to explain why Sam may be eating so many calories. The first of these, so our sixth point, is that if people eat in a long eating window, for example by starting with breakfast early in the morning, a late dinner and then snacks right before bedtime, they tend to eat more calories. Therefore, Sam should adopt time-restricted eating, or TRE, 
in which he eats all his calories in a 6 to 10 hour eating window each day. So if he did 8 hour TRE, he could eat between say 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. and then he would fast the remaining 16 hours of the day. Independent of all other factors, following TRE reduces the number of calories someone spontaneously consumes without consciously restricting food intake. So the sixth strategy is to follow time-restricted eating and eat only in a 6 to 10 hour window each day. And seventh, we know that almost no one eats only because they are physiologically hungry. Most of us also occasionally eat for social reasons or because we are dealing with certain emotions such as boredom, anxiety or depression. We call this non-hunger eating and this food intake does contribute to excess calorie intake and weight gain. For Sam, it would be worthwhile to learn about this topic and most importantly, understand whether and how this may apply to his eating habits. That could be the first step on a path to reduce non-hunger eating, potentially by addressing the psychological factors underlying it. So the seventh strategy is to identify what may be contributing to any non-hunger eating and find other ways to respond to these triggers. Now let's assume Sam takes all of these suggestions to heart and starts implementing them. How will that affect his calorie intake and body weight? The impact of diet quality on calorie intake and body weight. Okay, so Sam had been eating about 3,600 kilocalories on his average American diet. And he was slowly gaining weight, which means his daily energy expenditure was lower than 3,600 kilocalories. Let's assume it was 3,400 kilocalories per day. Now, what I've been explaining is that if Sam starts improving the quality of his diet, here on the y-axis, then the number of calories he needs every day to feel comfortably satiated will gradually decline. So even if he just makes a few small improvements, his daily calorie intake will decrease to 3,400 kilocalories per day, which matches his energy expenditure and he will stop gaining weight. That's a first success. Now let's assume he's very motivated and implements all of my suggestions. He cuts out all sugar sweetened and alcoholic beverages, minimizes ultra processed and other hyper palatable foods, reduces the energy density of his meals and dramatically increases his protein and fiber intake. He adopts eight hour time restricted eating and finds different ways to act on the psychological triggers that used to make him grab some rewarding snacks. How does all of that affect his calorie intake? We don't have any study in which all of these factors have ever been tested together and the effect almost certainly varies somewhat from person to person. But I would guess based on the research on all of these factors that he may very well reduce his daily calorie intake to somewhere around 2400 kilocalories. Again, that is not because he is tracking calories or actively restricting his food intake. He still eats every meal until he is comfortably satiated. It's just that now his diet quality and eating habits are so good that he will be as satiated with 2400 kilocalories per day as he was on 3600 kilocalories per day on the average American diet. Initially his daily energy expenditure will still be around 3400 kilocalories per day. So if he only eats 2400 kilocalories per day now, that's a 1000 kilocalorie per day deficit and he will start to lose weight. And as he is losing weight, as his body mass is reduced and his body responds to the lower food intake, his total energy expenditure will also gradually decrease. Until at some point he will find a new balance or equilibrium at a lower body weight where both his daily caloric intake and his energy expenditure will be around 2400 kilocalories. Well, not exactly, because as Sam is losing weight, there will be adaptive processes in his body to prevent excessive weight loss. As a result, he'll get more hungry over time and need more food to be fully satisfied. And he may get sick of being so perfect with his diet all the time, and some of his old habits will sneak back in. Maybe he will want to enjoy beer or some pastries every once in a while. But maybe he'll find his new equilibrium at say 2600 or 2800 kilocalories a day. His body weight would certainly be much lower on his new improved diet and as long as he can happily maintain his new eating habits, he has a good chance of maintaining that lower body weight. Why I don't recommend calorie counting by itself? Wouldn't Sam be able to achieve the same result just by tracking and actively restricting his calorie intake? That will allow him to maintain his normal diet with all of his preferred foods and he could simply count calories and make sure he doesn't get more than 2400 kilocalories per day. 
Well, of course, initially this would work as well. However, there is a reason he eats 3,600 kilocalories and not 2,400 kilocalories per day on his typical American diet. The foods and drinks he consumes are not very satiating per calorie, and if he only eats 2,400 kilocalories, he'll be hungry all day, every day. This gap here is Sam's hunger gap, and no one has enough willpower to ignore this much hunger every day forever. That's why I think that just focusing on tracking and restricting calories is not a good approach by itself. Now that said, I'm not categorically against calorie counting. Evidence suggests that it can be helpful to some people. However, I feel strongly that calorie counting and active calorie restriction is not likely to be successful in the long term if it isn't also combined with an improvement in diet quality. Whether you want to count calories or not, you need to improve the quality of the foods you eat if you want to reduce your calorie intake and body weight and have a chance to keep them reduced. The point is to feel satisfied with your diet so that you will continue it ideally forever. Summary and recommendations. In summary, we have solid scientific evidence that the number of calories we eat is determined by the quality of our diet. We can use this evidence to reduce our risk of overeating and weight gain or even lose weight without any calorie counting or active calorie restriction. So what should you do if you want to be comfortably satiated with fewer calories and lose weight? First, stop drinking sugar, sweetened and alcoholic beverages. Second, replace ultra-processed foods with unprocessed or minimally processed foods. Third, minimize your consumption of hyperpalatable foods consisting of fat and sugar, fat and salt, or refined grains and salt. Fourth, consume mostly meals with a low energy density by using added fats and oils, added sugars and syrups, and refined grains and starches sparingly. Fifth, center each meal around a solid portion of a protein-rich food and high-fiber plant foods. Sixth, follow time-restricted eating and eat only in a six to 10 hour window each day. And seventh, identify what may be contributing to any non-hunger eating and find other ways to respond to these triggers. Practically speaking, I recommend eating as much of your food in the whole or minimally processed form as possible. Minimize beverages with calories and be very careful with added fats and oils, as well as added sugars and syrups. Always include at least some protein in each of your meals. As a woman, aim for at least 20 to 30 grams of protein per meal. As a man, at least 30 to 40 grams as the lower end. Also, always include a solid serving of fiber-rich plant foods in each meal. Implement a form of time-restricted eating and become mindful of occasions in which you reach for food even though you're not really hungry. If your goal is to minimize your risk of weight gain, I think you can pick just a few of these suggestions and apply them loosely or most of the time. If you want to lose weight, you will find more success the more rigorously you follow these suggestions. However, my strongest suggestion is to experiment with, with these strategies and only use those that you feel you can happily sustain long term, ideally forever. If you can maintain your new way of eating happily long term, you also have a much better chance to maintain a lower body weight long term. Give it a try and let me know how it goes in the comments below. If you have any questions about the specific strategies, I have made several videos in which I have discussed this topic in much more detail. You can find these videos in the playlist Keys to a Healthy Body Weight, which I have linked in the description box below. In these videos, you will find detailed discussions of each of these factors and a few others, as well as links to blog posts and that include all of the scientific references. Okay. That's it for this video. If you found this helpful, I would appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up below. Also consider sharing the video with anyone you think may be interested. Lastly, let me say a heartfelt thank you to all the patrons of this channel. If you would like to support the creation of our free evidence-based content, please consider becoming a patron of the channel over at patreon.com. Being a patron comes with some perks, such as being able to directly ask me questions about the videos in live calls or a chat community. I have left a link in the description box below. Thanks so much and take care.